Hi, welcome back. We now move on to a short sequence of lectures looking at aspects of the vascular system. We do a couple of lectures which are going to be on the cardiovascular system in general and key aspects of that. And then we'll spend another couple of lectures looking at inflammatory processes and the kind of pathophysiological changes that have taken place during these events. But today we're going to start off with cardiovascular one. Um, quite snappily titled, it's the first cardiovascular lecture I'm going to deliver. So I've sneakily called it Cardiovascular Pharmacology 1. Um, but no surprise then that the second one is going to be called Cardiovascular Pharmacology 2. So um, you know, it does exactly what it says in the tin. Two key areas we're going to focus on. I mean, the cardiovascular system is, is, you know, is a huge area with many, many conditions and diseases and problems that arise within it. It would be impossible within a single module, particularly looking at pharmacology, to go over and over a whole lot of different areas. So what we're going to look at today are two key bits, hypertension, high blood pressure and heart failure, and how we can come about and get, get some changes when things go wrong in these areas. Your blood pressure is determined by two main factors. The cardiac output that is the amount of blood that's leaving your heart in any given minute. And the total peripheral resistance. That is the resistance to flow through the blood vessels. And the formula is nice and simple. BP equals CO times TPR. Cardiac output, total peripheral resistance. Now, the volume of blood in the system is also important. Because the more blood you put into the system that will also affect the pressure. So if blood volume goes up, that can also have an impact as well. And we need to bear all those factors in mind when we're looking at ways to manipulate high blood pressure. There are various categorizations here. It's, you know, you, with subtly different ranges. But really what you're looking at is you would be considered to be normotensive as long as your systolic was below 130 and your diastolic is below one, um, sorry, 85. And then you move up into mild, moderate, severe and very severe. This area here, if when you're in this sort of range here, you're not necessarily looking there for pharmacological interventions. What you're looking at more is this idea that you, you would probably be encouraged to try and see if you could bring this type of blood pressure down by you know, being more active, <coughs> weight loss, exercise, etc. Lifestyle changes, if you, will, if you will. Once you get into these, the realms of these areas, though, this is where the drugs are likely to be kicking in. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. So... Over 90% of all cases of high blood pressure are referred to as essential hypertension. That is when there is no obvious cause. Why essential? You know, I think it, I suppose in very simple terms, if you go to your GP and he you measures your blood pressure and they do a whole battery of tests and they can't find out why your blood pressure is up, it may be less of a, an impact on you if they go, ah, yeah, you've got essential hypertension, rather than saying to you, your blood pressure's sky high, I haven't a clue why it's like that. You know, you might lose an element of confidence. So, essential just means it's, it's the essence of you, it's just there, and there's not any specific reason, it's not an underlying condition, it's not necessarily, you know, um, problem with the kidneys or all sorts of other factors that could raise your blood pressure. And the vast majority of cases are like that. Possible causes, all sorts of things have been put in. High salt diets affecting the electrolyte balance, renal dysfunction, problems with the excretion of sodium, problems with retention of sodium, you know, high, different levels of blood volume, so fluid, fluid retention would increase your blood volume. Vasoconstriction, the, the blood vessels constricting, therefore increasing total peripheral resistance. So a whole range of possible causes that could result in an elevated blood pressure. What we've got here is a little flow diagram. Now I'm going to do one of my wee wonders around the back of the camera just to see what it might look to you on the screen. Not too bad this one, but again, another one of the diagrams that I would recommend that you print off as a single PowerPoint slide and then 
look at it in, in a lot of detail. What we're looking at here is one of the natural systems in our body that monitors um, falls in blood pressure and brings it back up. Now, what you've got there then is, this is known as the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or the RAS system, R-A-A-S. So, let's start at the top. Our arterial pressure is fallen. That means the perfusion pressure of the blood around the body has gone down. The perfusion pressure goes down, that means the perfusion pressure, the blood flowing through the organs, the pressure of the blood through the organs also falls. So renal perfusion pressure drops as one example of that. So that's the, the flow of blood through the kidney, the pressure of that blood goes down. That activates the enzyme renin which results in the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. You've now started a cascade of events because angiotensin 1 gets converted to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is like the magic substance with a whole variety of functions. Firstly, it increases aldosterone levels. And if the aldosterone goes up, so too does the sodium reabsorption in the kidney. So more, so more sodium stays within the body, and if more sodium stays, more water is retained. Fluid levels in the body rise, therefore blood volume rises. And that additional blood within the system will elevate the blood pressure and pop it back up towards normal following the fall. It also affects sodium hydrogen exchange, meaning more sodium reabsorption, and exactly the same as we mentioned before. It increases our thirst, more fluid intake, more fluid level, more blood volume, increased pressure. And finally, it causes vasoconstriction of the peripheral blood vessels, and that vasoconstriction narrows the blood vessels and increases total peripheral resistance. And remember in our little formula, TPR goes up, so does blood pressure. So all of those things happening there are elevating the blood pressure. So that's a nice system that we have that's monitoring the blood pressure and changing it up if it starts to fall. Now, that's actually quite good because if we get mechanisms within the kidney, we can target those mechanisms. And if we target those mechanisms and block them or interfere with them, that might be a way of not... If, if all these mechanisms elevate pressure, if we stop them, that will lower pressure, so we can have an anti-hypertensive action. Let's start here. Renin. Give a renin inhibitor. An example there is Alskyrin. That blocks this, therefore this doesn't happen. So none of this happens, so pressure doesn't rise. Next, give an ACE inhibitor, an angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor. Therefore you don't get angiotensin 2 being made, therefore none of this happens, pressure falls. What about an angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist? That means this compound, like losartan, blocks the receptor that the ang angiotensin 2 would work on, therefore you don't get this happening. Then over on the far side, you can give the clarinone, which blocks the binding of aldosterone, therefore you don't get the aldosterone effect, you don't get the sodium reabsorption, you don't get the pressure elevation. And finally, diuretics, for example, furosemide. Diuretics, to put it as delicate as possible, diuretics make you pee more. Therefore, you lose fluid, fluid levels within the body go down, and with that, so does blood volume, and if blood volume goes down, so does blood pressure. Okay, so those are the kind of, if you like, act, drugs that act via interaction with renal systems. But obviously, we can also have drugs acting on the blood vessels and the heart directly. Now, we said that most cases of high blood pressure would be known as essential high blood pressure, with no known cause, but the remainder are called secondary hypertension, and that is where there's an underlying disease or condition that will cause the elevation of the blood pressure. Now, we've just seen how important the kidney is in controlling blood pressure. 
So it is possible if there's renal disease or renal dysfunction that a person can have as a secondary event a high blood pressure. You can also have things like hormone levels being disrupted, elevation of aldosterone through a hormone dysfunction that would cause high blood pressure. And then we've also got oral contraceptives which can act on that RAA system that we saw before, resulting in an elevation of blood pressure. So there are certain conditions or drugs or medications that can cause high blood pressure, and that would be known as secondary hypertension. So how do we treat it? Well, we've mentioned the diuretics already on the previous diagram. What we're looking at now, though, these are the beta blockers and the vasodilators. These are the ones that are in addition to all the ones that we had on the diagram, working through renal mechanisms, these are the ones that are working directly on the cardiovascular system, on the heart, the muscle of the heart, and the blood vessel. So the diuretics, very briefly, you get loss of sodium, you know, and with that the fluid goes. We've, we've touched on that already, so therefore you get an increase in urine volume. And there's a little thing there to show you where the various drugs are going to work. They work at different parts of the loops. You know. So for example, you've got the ascending limb there, and you've got the proximal tubule over there, the descending limb down here. And you can see there, what we've done is we've colour-coded all the different types of diuretics to show you where they actually affect the absorption, reabsorption levels. And, but the end result is, no matter where they work, they're going to affect the absorption, reabsorption in such a way that you'll get increased urinary outflow. The beta blockers are probably one of the best known examples. Yeah? The, again, they do exactly what they say on the tin. They block the beta adrenal receptor, specifically beta 1. Beta-1 adrenal receptors are found in the cardiovascular system in the heart. Beta-2 are found in the airway. So what we've got here is we've got beta-1 blockers. Now, what they will do is they will work to reduce the pace of the heart and reduce the force of contraction. So what they're doing then is if we think back to that little formula we have, that blood pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the total peripheral resistance. The pen's a wee bit offset here, what am I like? Looks like I can't write. BP equals CO times TPR. Right? Now, if the beta blocker blocks the beta-1 adrenal receptor that's found on the pacemaker, noradrenaline can't work on the pacemaker, so the heart rate goes down. Beta-1 receptors are also found on the ventricular muscle these drugs block the, the noradrenaline action there and therefore reduce the force of contraction. And as a consequence of that, they reduce the cardiac output. Because the cardiac output that we've mentioned, the cardiac output is equal to the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. So if we decrease the heart rate or decrease the force of contraction, then obviously we'll decrease cardiac output. And if we decrease cardiac output, go back to the formula, if that goes down, so does that. That's how the beta blockers work, and that's why they are anti hypertensive The other thing that we can do is, rather than work directly in the heart to have an impact on cardiac output, we can directly impact on the total peripheral resistance. Now again, back to our formula, I'm going to keep putting that up just so we get it in our head. Blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by total peripheral resistance. Oops, sorry, just write that for you. Don't get into that fella there. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, I'll tell you what I need to do, I need to put that down. We can delete all this. There we go. We've got this concept that blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. What these drugs are doing, because they are vasodilators, they are opening up the airway, sorry the airway, the blood vessel, and if they open up the blood vessel, 
there is less resistance to flow. And if the flow resistance goes down, that's the TPR going down, what's going to happen over here? Blood pressure goes down as well. And there are various ways that you can get a relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle, i.e. vasodilatation. Calcium antagonists. Some examples there, verapamil and ephedipine, some of which you may have heard of or not. Um, they block the voltage-gated calcium channels on the surface of the smooth muscle membrane. That means that if the voltage-gated calcium channels are blocked, calcium cannot enter the muscle. Now, if I can take you back to basic muscle physiology, muscles contract because actin and myosin come together. What promotes the interaction of actin and myosin? Calcium levels. So if you prevent calcium coming in, there's less calcium available, actin and myosin don't interact, therefore you get a relaxation of the blood vessel wall. The vessel relaxes or dilates, total peripheral resistance goes down, and blood pressure falls. You've also got alpha-1 blockers. These, there are alpha-1 receptors that are found on the blood vessels. And these alpha-1 receptors found in the blood vessels cause constriction. You give an alpha-1 blocker, such as prazosine, the noradrenaline cannot work on the alpha-1 because it's blocked. You don't get constriction, you get dilatation. And if the blood vessels dilate, total peripheral resistance goes down and blood pressure goes down. Then we've got the angiotensin converting enzyme ones. We've mentioned these from before. We mentioned them back in the diagram. They block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Therefore, you don't get the vasoconstriction. So although they were on the renin-angiotensin system slide, these are having a more direct action on the blood vessels because the angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor. And so therefore, if you block the conversion to angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 levels fall. Vasoconstriction doesn't happen. You get vasodilatation. Total peripheral resistance falls and therefore blood pressure falls. So, we've had a wee look at that. We've had a wee look at the heart, the, the, if you like, wanting to reduce the workload of the heart, I suppose, is the one way of looking at it. Blood pressure's high, your heart's doing too much, so you need to bring it down. Let's flip to the other side of the problem, heart failure, where your heart's not working as it should. So, in heart failure, yep, it's the opposite. So when you have high blood pressure, you want to reduce the force of contraction, and you want to get vasodilatation. In heart failure, you want to promote the, the contraction of the heart. Yep. And, but you also want dilatation as well, because you want to be able to get the blood flowing out the heart easily. So you want the heart to work better and the blood to flow well. So what might cause heart failure? Well, it can be caused by myocardial infarction or heart attack. It can be caused by chronic hypertension. It can be caused by an arrhythmia. And we're going to come on and talk about those in another lecture. Or it can basically be even there's a volume overload in the system caused by valve problems. Yeah. So there's a lot here that's basic cardiovascular physiology that we don't have time to go into. So I can direct you back to maybe some of the physiology texts that you may have, just to have a little look at what these things are. So, treatment. Now, what you want to do then is you want to get the enhanced contraction of the heart and you want the heart to be contracting to get the blood out there and you also want the blood vessels to be nice and patent and open. Drugs that do that, cardiac glycosides, phosphodiesterase inhibitors and beta agonists, the opposite unsurprisingly to beta blockers which we use for high blood pressure. Cardiac glycosides they all end in IN, digoxin, digitaxin, wabane, trophanthin. Yep. 
but they may improve the short term symptoms, but the jury's still out on whether they're beneficial in the long term. We've got the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Phosphodiesterase is an enzyme that breaks down cyclic AMP. So, let's take you back a step. When noradrenaline works on the heart, it works on a beta-1 adrenal receptor, which is a G-protein coupled receptor, which links to adenylate cyclase, which elevates cyclic AMP. Okay? And it's that elevated cyclic AMP that increases the force of contraction within the heart. So, through that again, noradrenaline in the heart muscle works on beta-1 adrenal receptors. They are G-protein coupled receptors linked to a G-protein which is linked to adenylate cyclase so you get the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. And that elevation of cyclic AMP is what causes the heart to contract. Now if the heart isn't contracting with enough force, what you can do is you can give a phosphodiesterase inhibitor and what that will do is that will prevent the breakdown of cyclic AMP. So the cyclic AMP that you've got stays around longer and continues to support the contraction of the heart muscle. So cyclic AMP is the second messenger responsible for the contraction and what you do is you stop that being broken down. The beta agonists like dobutamine, they tend to be given in chronic heart failure emergencies and what they do is they don't really affect the heart they just have a massive effect on the beta-1 adrenal receptors in the ventricle to give you a real massive increase in the force of contraction. So they, they supplement the action of the noradrenaline that's already there. So what we've seen then in this PowerPoint is if blood pressure is high in the first part of the PowerPoint, how are we going to lower it? Well, one group of, one group, or several groups of drugs really, interact with mechanisms in the, the renal system. So you're looking there at your renin inhibitors, aldosterone blockers, and ACE angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, etc, etc. And then you've got the other ones that are working on the heart, the beta blockers, etc, that are looking to reduce the workload of the heart or the vasodilators that are opening up the blood vessel. And then the second part was looking at heart failure when you want to be driving the heart because it's not working properly. And that's when we're looking at the phosphodiesterase inhibitors and the beta agonists, which are the drivers of the heart. Thank you.